Thanks, uh, Richard and Kevin, for sharing that. And definitely we'll be keeping you in our prayers. Um, and it's encouraging to see, uh, that again, short-term trip, long-term impact. Uh, by them taking this step of faith, uh, they've also engaged us into the process, engaged us to think about these concerns uh, that they are talking about uh, as well. Um, I don't know if you've seen uh, the TV show uh, called Doomsday Preppers. Uh, sometimes it's on, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but it follows, usually each episode is about two or three families or individuals, uh, and it showcases these individuals. And these doomsday preppers are, are just that. They're preparing for doomsday. Uh, they're putting their life, their resources, all this time into preparing uh, for some catastrophic end-of-the-world event. Right. And so these doomsday preppers, they think that any second World War III could break out. I need to be ready. Uh, they think that there could be a nuclear holocaust. I need to be ready. They think there could be some, you know, crazy pandemic, avian bird flu. And so they do all these things to get ready for this. Uh, and they follow these people all around. There's families that have these bunkers and these shelters out in the mountains. Uh, there's these other families that have these huge caches of, of ammunition and guns. Um, after they, they aired these episodes, some of these families that had all this ammunition and guns, they, they end up getting investigated by the FBI. They're thinking, what is going on here? Why do these people have all this stuff? Or there's one guy in New York City, uh, and he was prepared that, I don't know, if Godzilla attacked, if, if for some reason they lost water, right? Uh, he had this huge, in his bathtub, he had this huge, this, pla this rubber bladder, 50 gallons of, of water in his bathtub, so that if they've lost access to water, he would have water right there. Yeah, you know, I'm watching. I'm thinking, well, in the meantime, how does he shower, right? Uh, there's this other lady. She's collecting hundreds of seeds, hundreds and hundreds of seeds. Uh, because in the event that everything gets destroyed and somehow she survives, she can replant the earth and repopulate with vegetation. So kind, right? Uh, there, there's this other family. Uh, Year-round, they, they run these biohazard drills. Uh, in case some chemical warfare, something hits them, they've got this huge outdoor shower that will just drench and douse them. And they run through these, uh, they practice putting on biohazard suits. They've got all these preparations. It's totally overkill, right? When I think about my dad, I think he has tendencies to be a doomsday prepper. Uh, except that he, he doesn't believe in aliens or Bigfoot or Godzilla. Uh, he does, however, believe in big fish. I remember going fishing with him as a kid. Uh, I would go there with my fishy Ron. He would give me the live shrimp as bait. I would cast it out. Then I would catch my fish. I would get these nice little seven, eight inch fish. Uh, my dad called this bait fish. So he would take the fish that I caught, use it as his bait, hook it up to his oversized fishing pole. He'd then take his huge fishing pole, stick it to a fishing pole anchor, and take that fishing pole anchor and clamp it to the railing of the pier. Big fish. And as I thought to myself, man, as a kid, I was always rooting for my dad. I was always hoping that dad would catch that big fish. Uh, but now as an adult thinking back, I think I'm more grateful than anything. I'm grateful that I never came face to face with that fish that required a clamp to the pier. Talk about overkill. Talk about excessive. I think oftentimes when we look at outlandish and outrageous solutions, oftentimes solutions can seem crazy, excessive, can seem a bit overkill. When we don't see that there's a problem that warrants that solution. When we don't see that there's a problem that warrants doomsday preppers, that warrants this huge fishing pole, we often see that the solution is crazy, outlandish, excessive, and unnecessary. However, likewise, once we realize the need that it's not unnecessary, once we realize the solution is warranted based on the need, our minds can change. I'll laugh at my dad, you don't need that pole until he catches that big fish, I think, yeah, you need that pole. We can laugh at the guy in New York City, he doesn't need all that water. Until New York City runs out of water, then we think, okay, this guy's onto something. When I read stories about God, often I'm struck with that. The ways that God responds and reacts, oftentimes I think, man, God, that's excessive, that's unnecessary, that's oftentimes quite literally overkill. 
In the Old Testament, you see when someone lies or cheats or sins, or sins, and God kills them. He wipes out their family. He wipes out entire nation. I'm thinking to myself, God, that's literally overkill. God, was that necessary? But then when we see, indeed, the problem warrants this type of solution, when we then see the problem of sin and separation and just how holy and righteous and mighty God is, then we say, wow, that was necessary. That was just. When we look at the Old Testament and instruction to Israel about how they come to worship God, instruction for the tabernacle, instruction about the material for the furniture, where to put the furniture, who can go into the tabernacle, who are going to be the priests, how to divide the tribes, how to divide the people, what garments to wear, how to wear it, all these instructions. And we think to ourselves, wow, this is excessive, this is overkill, there's too many details here. But we think about the separation of man and sin and how great and mighty God is, we then realize that all these ex- instructions isn't overkill or excessive. It's quite necessary. It's quite simple. It's an act of God's grace. When we see Jesus, God's son coming to earth, dying on the cross, but not only that, he was betrayed, he was beaten and bruised, and he died. Maybe we think, wow, God, that's a bit excessive. That's overkill. Couldn't Jesus just show up, teach, and then leave? He didn't have to die, did he? But then we realize it's not overkill. It's not unnecessary. We see that the problem warrants the solution. The problem requires this excessive solution. This morning... We're going to look at another excessive overkill solution. We're going to look at another instruction, a solution that God gives to us. And oftentimes we don't apply it to our lives because we don't know how. We're going to look at a problem this morning that we oftentimes don't apply to our lives because, quite frankly, it's easy to see as overkill, excessive. It's easy to see, or rather it's hard to see how it applies to our lives. It's a solution that we don't see oftentimes that the problem warrants. And as a result, we fail to apply it to our lives. And so this morning we'll see three things. We'll see a problem, solution, and application. Uh, but this morning, we're going to change the order up a little bit. First, we'll look at the solution. What is this solution that we oftentimes fail to apply to our lives? Then we'll look at the problem. Okay, in order to apply this solution... We're going to see, does the problem warrant this solution? And we'll finish with application this morning. This morning we're going to land in Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll look at verses 10 through 20. So please turn with me your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll look at verses 10 through 20. You can find Ephesians in the New Testament in the right side of your Bibles After Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John keep going a little bit, right after Galatians, you'll find Ephesians. If you see Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, you've gone too far. Ephesians will be in chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Paul is writing this letter to the church at Ephesus, and he's writing this during his first imprisonment in Rome, around 60 to 62 AD. There he's in Rome in his first imprisonment. He's under house arrest, under 24-hour watch. And during this time, he writes his prison epistles, these letters that he writes to the churches. Uh, Some of the other ones he writes, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, are also during this time. This letter to the church at Ephesus, uh, we see that in chapters 1 and th- through 3, uh, he reminds the early church of the gospel. That we are saved by the grace of faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by our effort, it's not by our works, but it's an act of grace of God. And then in chapter 4, in light of chapters 1 and 3, 2 and 3, in light of this new life we have, then in chapter 4 we are to live in unity. Unity with one another. How? 
chapters 5 and 6 tell us how. We are to live in unity with one another through love. And in chapters 5 and 6, uh, Paul describes this type of love that we are to have for one another. And he describes it through three distinct relationships. The love and unity that husbands and wives are to have. The love and the unity that children and parents are to have. The love and the unity that bond servants and their masters are to have. And then here in the second part of chapter 6, Paul concludes his letter. And he presents a solution for the early church. Paul concludes his letter with this solution. So what is the solution that he gives? Let's look, starting with verse 14. Stand, therefore. So again, stand, this imperative, this command. It's a sense of urgency to do it now, immediately, right away. Be ready, stand. How? Having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So first, what is the solution that Paul gives? Here, Paul is talking about putting on the whole armor of God. I think this is, for many of us, a very familiar concept, a very familiar passage. Oftentimes we teach this to our children because it's fun and it's interesting and, and, and it's creative, right? I remember learning about this passage when I was a child. We color in the parts of the armor. Oh, what do you think each part of the armor means? How is each part of the armor used? What is each part of the armor for? And so by the end of Sunday school, I've got this awesome soldier with his decked out armor. And I'm like, yes, armor of God. I'm going to put on this armor of God. But sadly, what happens? When I look at my life, it looks good on paper. It looks good on the drawing. Yes, put on the armor of God. But as a child, as a teen, as an adult, now when I go about my daily life, how often do I actually put on the armor of God? Let's look what each piece is and what each piece means. 14, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. The belt holds the rest of the garments together. Hold fast in your character, your Christ-like character, your Christ-like identity. Hold on to that. Going on, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Our righteousness in Christ. This is holy and righteous living. This is living as those who are following Jesus, living a sanctified life, being set apart from sin and set apart to God for his purpose. Put on God's armor by following Jesus, set apart from sin and set apart to God. 15, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Putting your feet in the steadiness, in the readiness, so that when troubles come, you won't waver, having what? The shoes of peace in the gospel. When challenges come your way, when you're threatened to be tempted to waver, to be thrown to and fro, you can stand firm because you have the peace of the gospel. Uh, moving on. In all circumstances, taking up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, the salvation through Jesus Christ, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, that we can use and recite Scripture to fight back the foe. The armor of God. How often do we put on the armor of God? Oftentimes, I fail to put on our guard because when I look at it, I think, man, it's quite heavy, it's quite dense, it's a bit unnecessary, it's a little overkill for what I do in my life, right? Uh, so imagine this, in your daily life, let's say you go to Brahms, okay, and you're there in line, you're going to order ice cream, chocolate or vanilla, ooh, can't decide, okay, 
I'm going to put on the armor of God to make this decision, right? Chocolate or vanilla, I need the armor of God. So, okay, I got my belt of truth, chocolate or vanilla, uh, breastplate of righteousness, okay? I got my shield of, of, of faith and truth so I can, I can deflect a uh, uh, birthday cake flavor telling me it's good. No, okay, bam, deflect that flavor, deflect that flavor. All right, let's keep moving on, right? Uh, I need to have the shoes on and the gospel. Okay, what flavor am I going to choose today? And if the lady or the guy at the counter tries to upsell me an extra scoop of ice cream, hey, I've got the sword of the spirit. I've got the word of God. I'm just going to recite scripture back at them. You can't make me get another scoop. Right? A bit excessive for Brahms, isn't it? So I'm just going to leave the armor of God in the car. I'm going to go in vanilla or chocolate, yes, both, okay, and make my way out, right? Uh, when you're taking your tests, your exams, the SATs, A, B, C, or D, and then when the teacher throws in the almighty option E, all of the above slash none of the above, all right, armor of God time, right? Belt, breastplate, shield, sword, shoes. But no, we don't need the armor of God to take a test. We, we, we need the helmet of memory, the, 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 the belt of, 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 of competency, uh, the, the, the sword of number two pencil, right? If you have a deadline, if, a, a project that's due, something that's, that's going to launch, you don't put on the armor of God, right? A breastplate of Red Bull, uh, uh, a sword of, of, of persuasive talk. You got to meet that deadline. You got to get people to move. Oftentimes we don't put on the armor of God. Because we don't see the need for it. It's overkill. It's excessive. But it's only excessive. It's only overkill when we don't realize that there's a problem that we face that warrants this excessiveness. That warrants this armor of God. And all these things that we face in the world, oftentimes we don't realize that we need the armor of God. Because we're only looking from a physical perspective. And the armor of God is all about spiritual matters. So no wonder when we're tackling the world only looking at physical things, then we see the armor of God tackling spiritual things. But when we're only interested in physical things, then we have no use for this. So let's look at the problem and see if that helps us. See if that warrants putting on the armor of God. Let's look at the problem then in verses 10 through 13. Uh, so again, in 14, stand therefore, right? Uh, oftentimes this, this, this part is just taught going from 14. Let's talk about armor of God. Let's put on the armor of God. But we have to miss out on why. What's the purpose of the armor of God? 14 starts out, stand therefore, therefore, because in light of what came before, do this. So if we ever start anywhere saying, therefore, it should bring our attention to what comes before that. In light of what, put on the armor of God. Ten, finally, okay, again, not to start there, but finally what? Finally it leads us to believe that, okay, there's something else that was said before this. Again, Paul tells chapters 1 through 3, in light of the good news of Jesus Christ, that you are saved, you have a new life in him. Chapter 4 Live this new life in unity. How? Five and six, through love in relationship, husbands and wives, fathers, mothers, children, bond servants, and slaves. So what is the problem that we face? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. If all we're doing in life is looking to live for the physical things, then by all means, yes, the armor of God is. It's overkill. The armor of God is unnecessary. The armor of God, you don't need it to wage the physical battle. But as followers of Jesus Christ, Paul is telling us that we wage a totally different battle. 
Let's look at 10 again. Sorry, uh, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So the enemy, the devil, that we may stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now Paul doesn't describe specifically what those schemes are. Uh, but by using this word schemes, we get an idea of his tactics. Schemes. The devil uses deception, lies, trickery. Think about the devil's schemes in the garden with Eve. Think about the schemes of the devil with Jesus in the wilderness. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The battle that we wage is not against flesh and blood. The battle that we wage is against evil spiritual forces, is against cosmic The battle that followers of Jesus Christ wage is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the physical, but it's against the spiritual. The battle that we wage as followers of Jesus Christ, we can't cut it with a knife. We can't shoot it with a gun. We can't blow it with a bomb. We can't out-argue it with words. We can't throw money at it. We can't cut it. We can't escape it through physical means. There's nothing we can do in our own power, in our own grasp, to overcome the battle that we face. Putting on the armor of God is excessive, is unnecessary, if all we're doing is looking at the physical things in this world. However, when we realize that there's a problem that warrants this excessive solution, would it draw us to use the armor of God to apply it in our lives? So here's a multiple choice question. A, B, or C. If, given that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, and you are not putting on the armor of God daily, A, are you spiritually naked? B, are you only invested in physical things and not in spiritual things? Or C, both A and B, all of the above. If we're not putting on the armor of God, then we're spiritually naked, spiritually vulnerable. And B, it tells us that we are not focused on spiritual matters. We're not focused on kingdom things, but we're focused on the physical, only on the earthly things. I think one of the schemes of the devil, schemes of the evil one, one of the great deceptions, especially for us here in the Western world, one of the great deceptions is that there is no spiritual warfare. One of the great deceptions is that there are no cosmic powers at play, that there are no evil spiritual forces. Because the more we believe that there aren't cosmic powers, that there aren't evil spirits, that there aren't evil forces, then the more we'll be more comfortable to focus on the physical things, then the more we'll be likely to not arm ourselves and be ready for the spiritual battles. We'll finish this morning with three application points. How do we put on this armor of God? How do we put on this armor of God? Uh, first and foremost, application number one, recognize that there's a problem that requires this solution. Recognize the problem, the need that we have for the solution. Realize that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against spiritual matters, evil powers, cosmic forces. So parents, you do a great job equipping your children physically. I have no doubt that they're equipped academically to succeed in academia, that soon one day they'll be taking over the workforces. Parents, you do a great job putting clothes on your children. Parents, you do a great job putting food in their bellies. But what worries me is that many of your children are wandering around spiritually naked. What worries me 
is that many of your children have clean clothes to wear, have full bellies, but are spiritually naked. What worries me is that your children know all about history, math, and science, but they have little knowledge of the character and the nature and relationship with God. Parents, if you want to set your children up for success, don't just focus on the physical things, but look to the spiritual matters as well. Students, adults, recognize that we not only fight physical things, but spiritual things as well. We wear ourselves down to the bone. Wear ourselves down to the bone at work, at school running errands, extracurricular activities. We work and wear ourselves down to the bone, fighting physical battles. But what is Paul saying here? We work ourselves to the bone, fighting the wrong battle. We work and we toil for physical things. All the while, are we wandering around spiritually naked? There's something we need that we can't provide for ourselves. And so we have this great spiritual need. What are we to do? First, recognize the great need. Then respond to that need by putting on the armor of God. What does that mean exactly? Right? At my home, I, I, don't, I don't really have a breastplate. Uh, I have this belt, but I don't have a belt of truth. Uh, I have these shoes, but, but how do I put these things on? When we look at these lists of things, at the end of the day, what, are, what is this, this armor? Uh, let's look at that list again. Uh, 14, stand therefore fasting on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word. So let's look at the list again. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, the word. Put on the armor of God. By knowing and drawing closer to him. All these things, the attributes of God. God, he is truth and righteousness. Uh, the deeds, the works of God. Faith. Salvation. Uh, missing one. Peace. All right, that one right there. Uh, and then uh, the word of God. Using scripture. Using his word. It's so important that all we do, we spend time knowing who God is. And again, how do we put this on? Again, it's more of a spiritual matter than a physical matter. I know myself included, the struggle can be many times, how do I spend time with God? Oftentimes, I don't have time to spend time with God. I'm too tired to spend time with God. In the morning, I'm too tired. At night, I'm too tired. During the day, I'm too busy to spend time with God with God, right? But all those things, what are all those things? What battles are those? I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. I don't know where to go to spend time with God. We're looking in the wrong place. We're fighting the wrong battle. All those things are physical matters. You don't have time. You don't have energy. You don't have space. These physical battles are symptoms of the true spiritual war you're fighting. If you don't have time, if you don't have energy, if you don't have space to spend with God, stop wrestling merely trying to find time, energy, and space by looking for time, energy, and space. Stop trying to fight the spiritual battle with physical energy and resources. If you find that you have the physical symptoms that you lack time, energy, and space with God. And I pray that you find the spiritual solution to these physical symptoms. 
what does the lack of time? What's the lack of energy? What's the lack of space for God? Not merely say about time, space, and energy, but more importantly, what does it say about your spiritual life? What does it say about your priorities? What does it say about how all the more you need to put on the armor of God? And lastly, once we recognize that there's a problem, the solution to put on the armor of God, then, then thirdly, apply it in the right area. Focus that energy. We'll conclude looking at verses 18 through 20. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare boldly as, ought, as I ought to speak. So here we put on the armor of God in order to do what? Not to engage in physical battle, but to engage in spiritual matters. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that and keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. The saints, for all believers. Who are believers? They're followers of Jesus Christ. What do followers of Jesus Christ do? They follow his commands. And what are his commands? What are they doing? They're making disciples by going, by teaching, by preaching, uh, by baptizing. They're being Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth. And what do the saints, what do believers need prayer for? What do they need perseverance in? They need prayer for fulfilling the Great Commission. They need perseverance in order to fulfill the Great Commission. Pray for one another to fulfill the Great Commission. Pray for perseverance. Encourage one another. When we have Asia Fest in May, we're going to set up a physical booth. We'll have physical games. We'll have physical activities. But we're going to wage a spiritual battle. Draw close to God, his character, build relationship with him. Know who he is and draw upon him. When we go out to Asia Fest, rely on the belt, breastplate of righteousness, the sword, the word of God, the helmet of salvation. Because when we get there, we'll need it because we'll be sharing that with others. For the Chicago missions team, we may get caught up in all the physical things, raising the funds, packing, making sure that we have all our forms and sheets in order, but we're not going to wage a physical battle. Put on the armor of God. It's a spiritual matter. For Kevin and Richard, when they go to Cambodia, it's a long flight. There's a lot of changes in time zones, in culture, and food. But we're not praying for them to wage a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle here at heart. This morning, let's take a moment to bow our heads and to meditate on God's word. As followers of Jesus Christ, We can get so wrapped up in the physical things that we can neglect the spiritual battle. These physical things are real, are certainly things to be dealt with, but they're symptoms of spiritual matters. I pray that we'll realize that without the armor of God, without relying wholly and solely on a relationship with God to persevere, to engage the world each and every day in the spreading of his word. If we don't have the armor of God, then we're spiritually naked and we're vulnerable to attack. That without God, we're weak and we're incapable of following Jesus Christ. I pray that we see the importance that each and every day we put on this armor of God.
It can be hard to find the time, hard to find the energy. But Lord, I pray that more than asking for more time, more than asking for more energy, I pray and ask that by your power, you overcome whatever strongholds there might be holding back. That you overcome whatever resistance, whatever cosmic powers, whatever principalities, whatever evil spiritual forces are working against us. Whatever it is that's hindering our desire, that's hindering our passion, to seek you more, Lord, that you take those away, you strip those away, you take away our desire for the world, our desire for material things, our desire for this kingdom here and now, to take away the desire to build up our name for our sake. And that you replace that desire, you place the world, our desire, with your kingdom, with your desire, with your heart. Lord, I ask that you take care of our spiritual matters so that the physical things would be fixed. I thank you so much for these opportunities to engage with our community and the world around us. I pray for each and every one of us as we go out this week that we be armed with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, with the shoes, the peace of the gospel, that we would have the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and that we'd be armed with the sword of the Spirit, with your word. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.